Our daughter was born on the 7th of January, 2025. That happens to be the first week of the first month of the first year, what is known as Gen Beta. <laughs> now, honestly, I have absolutely no clue how these generational names are actually chosen. To me, they sound more like software updates. But one thing is clear, that this generation will be the first AI native generation. For this generation, AI and ChatGPT were always there, just like the internet or electricity. She might grow up in a world where she essentially goes to school to make friends and to meet other fellow human beings. Because personalized learning is the norm. Or she might grow up in a world where you have super intelligent machines in the hands of numbed out humans. She could grow up in a world where AI truly amplifies the potential to create. Or she might grow up in a world where AI does all the fun stuff and the humans are left doing the dishes and the laundry. She might grow up in a world where everybody on the planet has access to education, to healthcare, to financial services. Or she might grow up in a world with severe cognitive inequality. Some with near superhuman abilities, others barely surviving. The future is truly hard to predict. It's not clear at all whether we'll have a dream scenario or a nightmare. But that future will certainly depend on the choices that we make today, and the seeds of those futures are also visible to us today. And as if that was not enough to top it all, today's AI will be the worst AI we will ever see. And that statement may always be true, because AI is expected to continuously grow by leaps and bounds. So let's face it, let's really face it, we are actually have a really unfair contest at our hands. Our poor biological neural networks at one end, and those artificial neural ones at the other. And what about our poor brains? No cooling fans. No GPUs, no upgrades, whereas AI keeps training on ever bigger data centers. So our most personal choice and our decision in this AI era is to actually grow our own neural networks. So let me return to my Kashmiri Tamil baby. She'll certainly be picking up at least three languages at home. She'll be introduced to the arts, sports, and of course, mathematics. I will also want her to learn to code. Of course, AI can generate any amounts of code in a matter of seconds. But learning to code will help her develop the elements of computational thinking. So languages, sports, arts, mathematics, coding, all to help her build her neurons. The kind of human capabilities that simply cannot be handed to you on a platter. But that's just the base. In an AI era, it isn't enough to learn. We need to create. And I'm sure almost all of us have gone through this experience. We've actually created those sort of uh, paper aeroplanes which as soon as it took off, it just landed below our feet, right next door. And before you knew it, you had this whole pile of sort of noseless aeroplanes. We tried, we failed. We tried, we failed. We tried, and finally we succeeded, and our planes began to fly. Creativity has a messy middle to it. What would happen to this messy middle of creativity in an AI world? Will your raw ideas, sufficiently polished, grammatically corrected, and presented with this illusion of polish and finesse, 
that we are led to believe that what we have created is in fact a genius first draft. How do we retain and amplify the human element in the creative process? In previous years, it was very comfortable and convenient and perhaps even sensible to work with like-minded people. But now, unlike minds are important. You see, what happens is that unlike minds provide the necessary friction that pushes us to come out of old habits and to innovate. Let me give a sort of collaborative experience that I personally really enjoy. So you've got the sort of three cast of characters, so to speak, sitting across the table, right? Uh, one is me, one is an industry person, and one is a student. So me, the researcher, brings in the domain expertise, well, hopefully. And you've got the industry experts who's got an excellent idea of what the market actually wants. And then you've got the students. See, what happens with students is they don't really differentiate between what's possible and what's impossible. They're just happy to explore. So the researcher gets a reality check, gets a sense of how the real world works. The industry person gets a scientific perspective to begin with and hopefully a scientific solution as well. And the student gets to work on a real world hard problem. I like minds. So this is all about ecosystems. What about us as individuals? Now let me take this opportunity to go back to my little human back at home. And I have this sort of vivid imagination where she goes to the first day at kindergarten. And you've got this friendly teacher who asks her, so what would you like to be? She sort of looks up. Maybe perhaps the teacher's expecting engineer, doctor, superhero. She looks up firmly and says, I'd like to be a pie-shaped human. And she quickly adds, a pie-shaped human is just a high-agency generalist who has a curiosity-driven research mindset with a fearless entrepreneurial attitude. <laughs> That's what she wants to become. Now let's look at the three strokes of pi, the horizontal and the two vertical ones. Each of these represent a very different kind of person with very different traits. The wide ones are the connectors, looking far and deep, making connections across domains. The deep ones are the diggers, carrying on digging until they actually have a breakthrough. The go-getters, they are the entrepreneurs. They build companies. They translate ideas into technologies which we use every day. All of these people are incredibly useful, incredibly valuable. But in an AI world, it isn't enough just to be wide, just to be deep, just to be a go-getter. It is incredibly important to have the ability to scan wide while simultaneously digging deep at hard problems and at the same point of time having the courage to build out real world solutions. So you see the go-getters, the connectors, the diggers built our present world. AI demands a full pie. Being pie is not easy. I'm still building my pie. And as I introspect, some parts seem a bit strong, some parts are weak, some parts are work in progress. But then that's the whole point. It's a lifetime construction project. I've been tasked to teach Introduction to Programming this semester. 
Till a couple of years ago, it was a matter of routine. Today, it's an existential question. How does one teach introduction to programming in an AI world? A few years from now, will I even be required to teach programming? And a few years on, would I even be required to teach? And these are some of the questions that you might be thinking in your lives, in your domains. What's going to remain the same? What's going to change? And what's simply going to vanish? This is the new reality of AI. Opportunities are coming, but they're also closing. We need to act on the opportunities that we see. This reality is here to stay. So at this point of time, what I would request is for all of you to introspect. What is the shape of your pie? Which paths are strong? Which paths are under construction? Everybody's journey to pi will be different. So everyone's pi will be unique. And you think you are pi enough? Not just to thrive, but to actually drive this new AI world, not just to survive, but to thrive in this AI world. And as you think of all the people that you know, your friends, family, colleagues, through a pi lens, who's the piest of them all? Admittedly, AI is powerful, but we are stories, we are possibilities, we are choices, and if there is anything in this AI world that we can truly design, it is ourselves. And so I request you to grow your pie, because the shape of your pie is the shape of your future. Thank you. <laughs>